What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Colton Posey Fishing. And today we're going to talk about pre-spawn bass fishing, how the bass act, where they go, uh, a little bit of the baits to use and stuff like that. Stay tuned. Get your notebooks out. It's something you don't want to miss. <laughs> Okay guys, so to start out, I'm gonna talk about where these bass go this time of year. So right now, I'm in Northern Alabama. That's uh, where I live. And the water temperatures around and stuff are in the, they're not in the mid 50s, they're in between the middle and the lower 50s. So we're talking like 53 degree water temps. So when this happens, you wanna start keeping up with the weather this time of year. I wanna look several days ahead. And the reason I want to do that, I want to see if we're having warming spells. Are these fish actually going to start pulling up and stuff like that? And they are. So what happens is these fish are transitioning from their wintertime haunts. So you might have found them on your, uh, uh, one of the lakes that I fish a lot during the winter is uh, Smith Lake. So Lewis Smith Lake in northern Alabama, it's on the other side of Jasper. These fish are sitting on the main lake points and stuff. They're, they're usually typically pushed off the main lake or uh, off the uh, main lake points. So, um, you know, I was catching them there and stuff during the winter, and uh, a lot of times what they'll do, they'll just transition. Now, this is a highland reservoir, so um, if you're fishing a highland reservoir, this is important. They're moving off of the points and moving back into these little creek arms and up in these uh, pockets and transitioning into the bends of the points and stuff like that, and that's where you'll find these fish. So, um, on like rivers and stuff, they'll be out they're not going to be on the main if it's a if it's like the tennessee river okay we'll, we'll just take uh we'll take pickwick for example these largemouth are not going to be on right on the edge of the current they're not going to be in the current during the winter they want to get out of that current as far away as they can from the current they're lethargic they don't eat as much they don't have to eat as much so they're eating big old gizzard shad or thread fin, you know, that's that's pretty good size. So they'll eat, you know, a few a day and they're good till tomorrow. So uh, they'll move back up into these pockets and these creek arms and stuff where there's not much current and they'll just sit out and suspend over the uh, channel. So um, one of the main places that I want to look in like lakes, okay, we're going we're gonna to just, uh, I'm just going to say lakes as a specific where it's not, there's not a lot of current being pulled and stuff like that. You, you, you know, it's, uh, it's mainly wind drawn current. That's, that's about it. So in these lakes and stuff, they're going to transition off of humps, ledges, main lake points of boat docks that are out in further deeper water that they might've lived there that winter. Um, they're going to start taking, they're going to go, it'll look like a highway on your contour maps. You're going to follow like what would be a ledge around and it's going to start going into these creek mouths. Sometimes they'll be right at the beginning of the creek. Sometimes they'll be in the second section of the creek where it's starting to, it's not in the back, but it's kind of in the middle. Uh, them secondary points, uh, boat docks, 45 degree banks, stuff like that. They're going to be sitting on stuff like that. Brush tops. Um, th they're, they're just moving up into them areas and they're sitting there waiting to feed. Okay, on your rivers, it's going to be very similar. Okay, um, they're not going to, some of the fish are still going to be close to the main lake and those ones are going to start pulling back, but your majority of the fish is already going to be partially in the creek. So basically, they'll move from, let's say right here is the middle of the river channel. Not the actual main river, but I'm talking about like in the creek. Right here's the middle. They'll suspend out in that middle. So all they're going to be doing while the water's heating up, they're just going to start moving out towards the banks. So you'll be able to catch them really shallow this time of year. So that's kind of what the fish do, and I hope that gives you an idea of what goes on during the pre-spawn. We're talking anything that's above 52 degrees. Um, I still consider 50 degree water temps winter. Um, if it hits over that 50 to 50 degree to 52 degree mark, they're really going to start moving. Um, you're not going to be catching as many fish as you was on the main lake. You're, you're going to start seeing more activity in your creeks and in your pockets and stuff like that. Because on these warming trends, the pockets, these shallow pockets and stuff like that will heat up faster. Uh, not only that, if you're fishing a muddy water system that's going to heat up faster so you know your north end of the lake or the dam's not nine times out of ten it's going to warm up a lot faster than the southern end of the lake just because it's muddier water um that that dirt 
the particles that are in the water actually absorbs heat and then it warms the water around it. So that's why your northern ends and stuff like that are a lot warmer typically than the other sides of your lakes. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of what's going on this time of year. And uh, now I'm going to go over a few baits that help you catch some of these fish. All right, guys, welcome back. So now we're going to talk about the baits that I use this time of year to target those fish that are in that pre-spawn mode. One of the main things that I want to do, I don't have a lot of time, okay? I don't get to go out there and spend seven hours in a creek and say, well, they ain't here today, so I'm going to come back tomorrow and see if I can find another creek. I want to be able to cover as much water as I can possible to find where the fish are to create a pattern that I can run all over the lake, okay? Or either that section of the lake, so whether it's the north, south, east, or western end of the lake. So one of the three baits that I typically use for a good search bait is a spinner bait, okay? And one thing you might notice about this, ain't no willow blades on it. There ain't no willow blades. We're going old school. It's a double Colorado's. This is an old school booyah, uh, three eight ounce double Colorado spinner bait. One of the reasons that I use the Colorado, a lot of people say that the willow blades are more natural. True. That is 100% true. I'm a firm believer in the willow blades. Will you catch fish during the pre-spawn on willow blades? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. <coughs> Colorado's move more water. They create more disturbance in the water. It gives off a bigger presentation. Creates bigger fish. This time of year, I'm throwing this Colorado blade. I'll never get a willow blade out of the box. Okay. Oh, uh, I... Not, I mean, I'm going to stick to just white and chartreuse. It don't matter if it's clear or muddy or what. Um, white and chartreuse, double Colorado, I'm going with a gold blade and a silver blade. Uh, the big blade's going to be gold. Small blade's going to be silver, just old school. Um, the only way I will change is if for some reason I'm fishing muddy water and I'm not really getting as much bites or they're kind of swapping at it. They're bumping into it, but they're not getting it real good, okay? I'll go to the Booyah Covert series, so... Um, basically, I'll run either a single Colorado that's got the orange blade on it, or either I will use the one that's got the orange blade uh, as the smaller one. That will help those fish see that bait moving through the water, and uh, they'll get a lot better strike on it. Now, my setup that I'm using for this, typically, if I'm fishing somewhere uh, like uh, uh, Smith Lake or something like that, there's not a whole lot of... There's not a whole lot of debris or nothing in the water. I'll typically run 12 pound of uh, fluorocarbon. Uh, I run Seaguar on this. Um, I like Tahatsu. A lot of you guys, I understand you can't afford no $40 for 150 yards of uh, line. Uh, Red Label works very, very well. Um, if I'm fishing somewhere like Smith Lake, Lake Lanier, or something like that, it's got really, really clear water, I'm using Invisex. Uh, nine times out of ten just because it, it's a lot thinner in diameter than the red label uh, That'll help create more bites Especially on pressured fisheries. So um, If I'm fishing like a river system somewhere like Gunnersville Pickwick or something like that that uh, Sometimes it's clear, but not necessarily. I mean, you know, it's not you can't see ten foot down uh, 15 pound I mean, that's about all you need. You might have to adjust a little bit, but uh, typically I'll run 15 pound um uh, fluorocarbon. I don't like the. Some people run it with monofilament. I don't like that stretch in there. I prefer um, uh, fluorocarbon where there's not as much stretch. I'll put a trailer hook on the back of this sucker and uh, I'll just slow roll it. I mean, I'm trying to bump it into everything. I'm using it kind of like a square bill. I want it hitting everything, banging off everything. I want it to cause as much of a disturbance and a hindrance to those fish as I can. So um, the rod setup that I like to use, here's something y'all are going to like. Duck it Green Ghost, okay? Um, this is a $79 rod, brand new. I mean, sh 79 bucks. I mean, you can't beat it. I throw a medium heavy. Um, I really like the medium heavy fast action. Um, so I, it keeps it really simple. It's got a lot of, um, it's got a pretty good bit of backbone in it where when I set the hook, I can really, really dig that hook in there. And it's still got enough give where I'm not just jerking it out of their mouth. Um, the reel that I like to use, I love the Daiwa Tatula series. This is a 6-8-1 gear ratio. Um, 
the drag system and the castability on the Daiwa reels is just amazing to me. Um, there's, there's a lot of good reels out there, but I really trust Daiwa for every application that I'm fishing. But guys, that's the first one that I'm going to pick up and start casting in them creeks. I got two more for you, so stay tuned. All right, guys. So the second one that I want to talk to you about, this is a well-known uh, lure to use during this time of year. Um, it is, is rattle trap. Okay. Um, I love the rattle traps. One of the first things that I'm going to do is change out them hooks. I'm going with a number six. If I'm using a quarter ounce, I'm going with a number six Gamakatsu EWG. If I'm going with a half ounce or bigger, I'm running size fours. Okay. Um, the biggest thing about this rattle trap, I can cover a lot of water. I can bang it off of stuff. I can, I can work it in deep water. I can work it in shallow water. I can work it anywhere i want to i can skip it up under docks i mean i can do so much stuff with a lipless crankbait it is ridiculous it's just like a jig it is one of the most versatile lures you'll ever put on the end of your fishing pole so um if your fishery is getting a lot of pressure i mean who's all going out there practice for two days and you're like <laughs> dude i'm on them i'm freaking smoking them tomorrow you get out there tomorrow, in about 30 minutes, you're like, uh, yeah, I haven't got a bite. So um, I've done it 100 times. It, it just happens. What happens is a lot of times you get these guys going down the same bank that you're going down. They caught 10 pounds during practice. You caught 10 pounds on that bank during practice. The fish just get wore out. But a lot of times they'll move out and suspend. They're very, very hard to catch. Or a lot of times they get to seeing the same bait over and over again that um, – they just, uh, they kind of become immune to it. So, not immune, but, you know, they get used to it. So, one of the things I like to do, colors, I don't go crazy with colors. I got friends that are colorblind that are fishers or anglers, and they can't tell the difference between the colors. They catch just as many fish as I do. So, the colors, uh, some of my sponsors are probably going to hate me saying this, but colors are to catch fishermen more than they are to catch fish. Okay, with a rattle trap, I keep it very simple. I've got a hundred red rattle traps and I got a hundred white rattle traps. That's all you need. Um, when the water's real good and muddy, or either if it's kind of dingy looking, I will throw the red rattle trap this time of year. Okay, now let's say the water is uh, three foot or more in visibility. Then I'm going to be throwing. A white rattle trap <laughs> so um i keep it I, I like the kiss method keep it simple stupid do do stuff as simple as you can if you can simplify your fishing game you'll catch a lot more fish whether it's in tournaments or you're just out there having fun so experiment with what you're doing and just kind of go through the motions of uh, what I'm telling you, and you'll you'll start figuring stuff little by little. I can tell you everything in the world, but until you get out there and apply that, you're not going to figure out what they're doing on your home lake. So, white, when the water's clear, something very, very natural. Red, when the water's muddy, sometimes when it's clear, just be versatile with it. Adjust what the fish are telling you. They whisper. Sometimes you don't hear them, but they talk. So, that's number two. And uh, let me go over my rod real quick that I use. Um, once again, Duck It Green Ghost. I the price point. I love these rods. Um, it's a seven foot cranking rod. Okay, it's medium moderate action. It's got a lot of tip to it. So um, I want that. I want that good bend, just because when that fish grabs that bait a lot of times they're getting it by the back hook and i go to set that hook i don't want my pole to be stiff where i'm jerking that lure out of his mouth so when i set the hook i want my pole to have that bend to where he has time to get it and stay hooked on so the reel that i like to use again is the daiwa tatula uh six eight to one gear ratio that's as slow as i'll go oh uh, with reels so guys that's number two let's move on to number three all right, y'all. Now we're going to talk about the third bait that I use to search for fish. This bait, 
Well, jig, I've, I've heard a lot of people they are scared to use jigs. They say that they don't get as many bites and stuff like that. It is a bait that you have to have patience on. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it to you. There is, uh, people ask me all the time, what color do you use? I keep it very simple, okay? Uh, you don't have to get crazy with the colors, okay? I use a black one when it's dirty, and I use a brown one when it's clear. Well, that's all you need. It catches them from coast to coast. I do have one that's specifically, for some reason in my mind, I think I catch more fish on it than any other color jig. It's not true. I just throw it more than any other jig. Um, but the jig that I prefer on the muddy water situations, this is a G-Money black and blue jig. One of the key things about the G-Money jigs is this sucker is wire tied. It has the rubber skirt. So instead of it being silicone, this rubber skirt has still got action under the water, but it's not something that's going crazy. It's real subtle. So I can barely just move my line and my, my skirt's just sitting there, barely moving, fluttering, looking real pretty, you know. So um, G-Money jig is a key. Um, I've made more money off through jigs than I have any other thing in the world. Um, these, uh, I don't... I can't tell you. I, I don't have a clue. I, I've used all kinds of jigs. For some reason, their jigs, to me, in my opinion, catch more fish than any other jig I've ever put in my hand. They're very versatile. One of the biggest things that I really, really like, it's hard to find a jig like this, the vertical line tie. So if you look, the line tie is going straight up and down instead of side to side. That provides me to go through a lot more stuff. Not only now can I go through rocks and brush, I can go through grass or whatever. So, once again, I'm throwing a black and blue jig when it's uh, uh, muddy. And then, when the water's clear, I'm throwing a brown jig or green pumpkin. I mean, whichever one you got. If it's got brown and green in it, it don't matter as long as it's natural. Um, one of the biggest things this time of year that I make sure, especially when that water temperature hits over that 50 degree mark. Let me get this out real quick for y'all. There we go. I got the, I got the bag of plastic. So y'all don't get too scared on me here. A yum, a yum crawl chunk. Um, these has got to go on the back of my jigs. Uh, they come in several different colors. Keep the blacks and the greens. Oh, uh, I mean, that's about all you need. They're like $2.99 a pack. You'll, I mean, you'll smoke them. Oh, uh, this time of year on these chunks in the jigs. Oh, uh, I don't really, I don't really sugarcoat them much with anything. Oh, uh, sometimes what I'll do, it seems to help a lot of times if the fish are acting a little lethargic. I'll take the uh, uh, Yum Scent. Um, you can buy it at like Walmart, Tech Warehouse, or anything like that. I'll get the Crawl Scent. That's, that's about the only one that I buy. I don't really use the Shad Scent much. Because um, moving baits, I'm trying to get them to react to it, not come up to it and sniff it. So, <laughs> uh, I'll just um, take that Yum Crawl Scent, hit it two or three times with a little bit of that. On top of the water, man, it's, uh, it's wild. The old uh, Yum Mighty Bug. I won a lot of money off that lure, and I don't know if it was necessarily just the bait or if it was the scent that I was spraying on it, but I would take that scent and just hit it three or four times, you know, every time I caught one, and, man, they uh, they tear it up. I mean, it, it was one of those things that made me a believer. You got to have scented stuff in your, uh, in your uh, arsenal. So with my jigs, the setup that I like to use, I like any of the ducket rods, but I try to keep it simple for y'all. I mean, <laughs> You don't have to go and buy a $300 rod to catch fish. I mean, $300 black ice rods, are they're awesome. <laughs> You're not going to beat them. I mean, they're, they're great rods. Um, but I fished with everything from $20 rods to three, four, $500 rods. And I've caught just as many fish on both. So keep it very simple to y'all. I like a uh, um, high-speed reel, 8 one to 1 gear ratio to Tula. Um, and I'm throwing the Green Ghost again. And this is a seven foot three inch medium heavy. That's what I like when I'm fishing shallow water. 
okay? And what I mean by shallow water is anything 15 foot and above. So 15 to zero foot, I'm throwing a seven foot three, medium heavy. If I get into that deeper water, if I'm fishing 25 feet or more, I'm throwing a seven foot six. I wanna get that lure down there, throwing a half ounce. I wanna get that lure down there. When I set the hook, I wanna be able to take up every bit of slack that I have in that line and get that hook through that fish's mouth. So seven foot three when you're shallow, seven foot six when you're deep. That is my setup, guys. That's pre-spawn bass fishing. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, give me a like. Don't forget to subscribe. Drop a comment if you got any questions. Uh, don't forget, um, first tournament coming up February the 22nd, Gunnersville Lake. If you're around, give me a holler. I'd be glad to meet up with y'all, uh, talk about fishing, whatever you want to know. Uh, might give y'all some free lures to try out. So uh, I appreciate all the support, guys. Y'all just stay out there and keep fishing. I hope you keep your lines tight. Uh, like I said, if you got any questions, just let me know. But we'll see y'all next time.